The recent bail-in in Cyprus has given the world a glimpse at the future of the banking landscape. Now, as Canada gets set to hardwire the bail-in process into law, analysts like Michel Chosodovsky are warning how the big banks can use this template to further consolidate their monopoly of economic control. This is the GRTV Backgrounder on Global Research TV. Those who follow the markets closely know that, at base, the current financial system is founded not on the bedrock of sound economic principles, but instead upon the quicksand of public perception. All it takes is one large bump in the road to upset even the largest of economic bandwagons and usher in a new financial paradigm. In the ongoing meltdown of the European Union, perhaps the greatest single bump in the road so far just took place in Cyprus. In the immediate aftermath of the dramatic bank holiday and bail-in events of last month, many in the financial media began asking whether Cyprus represents a template for future bail-ins across the European Union or elsewhere around the globe. If we are going to seriously ask this question, however, it is vital that we understand exactly what happened and what kind of template this might represent. The crisis in the Cyprus banking sector has been building for years, as the small island nation's banks began to account for a greater and greater share of its economy. The trigger events causing the recent crisis, however, was, appropriately enough, the result of a meltdown elsewhere in the Eurozone, in Greece. When a bankrupt Greece was allowed to let some of its private bondholders take a loss, a so-called haircut, Cypriot banks lost money and needed refinancing. Then the country's big institutions, like the Bank of Cyprus, asked the government for a bailout. In turn, the government went to the EU in June 2012 and asked for its own bailout. After months of negotiations, the government of Cyprus announced it was on the verge of a 10 billion euro bailout deal with the so-called Troika of the EU, the ECB, and the IMF. But when details of the plan emerged, including the fact that it had the confiscation of both insured and uninsured bank deposits baked into the cake, protests erupted around the country. These are Cyprus's savers and they're furious with their government and other Eurozone leaders. They're the people who are having to carry the weight of the EU bailout. The banks will get 10 billion euros to keep them afloat, but Cyprus has to find 5.8 billion more. It will come through a levy, meaning these people will lose between 6 and 9 percent of their savings. The final deal ended up keeping deposits under 100,000 euros untouched, but uninsured deposits were restructured, wiping out the savings and cash flow of foreign depositors and local businesses alike. For many, the question is whether this will be a template for future banking crises in the European Union and elsewhere. When Jeroen Dieselblum, president of the Eurogroup, intimated this was something that would be considered in future bailouts in an interview with Reuters in the Financial Times, markets panicked, causing Dieselblum to issue an immediate retraction of his recorded statements. The truth, however, is that this idea has already been discussed for years in the highest circles of the international banking sector. In 2010, the Bank for International Settlements issued a white paper on possible bail-ins of Tier 1 and Tier 2 bank capital in the event of future banking crises. The proposal was discussed in further detail by groups like the G20-created Financial Stability Board and private sector entities like KPMG, which issued a July 2012 report on the possibility of future banking bail-ins. During the midst of the Cyprus scandal, the Government of Canada released its own proposed budget for the coming year, including language that suggests a bail-in regime. The government proposes to implement a bail-in regime for systemically important banks. This regime will be designed to ensure that, in the unlikely event that a systemically important bank depletes its capital, the bank can be recapitalized and returned to viability through the very rapid conversion of certain bank liabilities into regulatory capital. This will reduce risks for taxpayers. The government will consult stakeholders on how best to implement a bail-in regime in Canada. In response to public furor over the proposal, Canada's finance minister was forced to come out last week to deny that the nebulously defined certain bank liabilities includes consumer deposits, but refused to clarify precisely what liabilities would be covered by such language. As Michel Chosodovsky, professor of economics at the University of Ottawa, explains, the real danger of the Cyprus example is not that this will be a common way of dealing with future bank stresses, but precisely the opposite. With the bail-in procedure in their arsenal, Bankers and their political cronies will be able to use this weapon of financial destruction, not against the too-big-to-jails of the big six megabanks in America or their counterparts around the world, 
but against smaller credit unions and independent banks that threaten their monopoly of power. Uh, just very recently, uh, the Canadian government has put forth a proposal. It's actually contained in a very long document uh, which was presented uh, by the uh, Minister of Finance, Jim Flaherty. Uh, it's entitled Jobs, Growth, Long-Term Prosperity, Economic Action Plan 213. And then hidden away in this 400-page report, on page 144, there's a statement to the fact that the Canadian government will implement what they call a risk management project. Now, the risk management project, textually, is that um, if the banks run into difficulty, and of course, the document says, in the likely, unlikely event that a bank runs into difficulty, the bank will be able to recapitalize and return to viability by uh, converting certain bank liabilities into regulatory capital. Now, what this really means in, in layman's English is that uh, these certain bank liabilities, which would be confiscated, what they are is the money uh, of customers, namely deposits. In other words, you and me. And so that these certain bank liabilities would be confiscated in exchange for shares, equity in, in the, a failing bank institution. Now, I, upon careful examination of this uh, whole process, um, it would appear that these, that this policy of confiscating deposits, if it were to be applied extensively in the European Union or in North America, would essentially target smaller and lesser banks rather than the big mega banks too big to fail, too, too big to jail. In other words, it wouldn't go after JP Morgan Chase or Citigroup or, you know, or even the, the Canadian, the large Canadian chartered banks as, such as Royal Bank or TD Canada Trust. It would go after the credit unions. Uh, it would go after smaller banks in Canada at the provincial level. Um, and in other words, what we are witnessing there is a mechanism. It's not a spontaneous process where a bank simply, uh, you know, uh, goes bankrupt and the, and the deposits are lost. This is something which is, is pre-planned. And, uh, and I suspect that the major financial institutions, uh, the members of the in Institute of International Finance, which is their, which is their think tank in Washington, D.C., and represents the largest banks um, on, on planet Earth, these people are behind it. Okay, And why are they behind it? because they want to consolidate the position within the banking landscape. So what we are now witnessing is more what I would describe as financial cleansing, okay? Um, financial cleansing is essentially wiping people off the map, off the financial landscape. So that uh, essentially you now have, um, you now have a, if you look at Canada, the United States, or even Western Europe, you have big banks, you have local level banks, you have credit unions, you have cooperative banks. Still, those have been weakened, of course, in the last 20, 30 years as a result of, of the integration of the banking system. But what they want to do is to clear these people off the map. It is financial cleansing, consolidate their position so that the world um, banking and monetary system would be controlled by uh, a, a smaller number of banks. And the banks which are targeted are precisely banks which have accumulated uh, derivative losses. And uh, these derivative losses may be owned, they may be owed, uh, I mean, in terms of debt formation. Once the losses are incurred, it then becomes debt. But by definition, a bank is always indebted because it has liabilities and has assets, and its liabilities are much greater than its, than its assets. 
But the situation is when, they, when those debts become unsurmountable uh, and they become unsurmountable due to, the, due to the creation of derivative debt, it's then that, that the big banks, the mega banks, will use, um, they will use their power to, um, to target the lesser banks and they can do it at will. They can select them and they can plan it in advance and then they will trigger the demise uh, and the bankruptcy of those lesser banks, take them over or close them down. So that is, the, that is the scenario. We're not dealing with a situation where, let's say, the depositors of J.P. Morgan Chase or HSBC uh, will, uh, will be uh, victims of, of um, deposit confiscation because immediately that would be a run on HSBC or J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, there may be selective uh, actions of that nature, so that the candidates for this uh, for this um, uh, policy, because it's it's a policy of of confiscating deposits. It's illegal in several countries. It it goes against the constitution in many countries, uh, particularly in Cyprus. But that selective process of confiscating deposits is there to trigger the demise of lesser financial institutions and thereby um, uh, trigger a mechanism of centralization of money capital uh, nationally and internationally. As Professor Chosodovsky goes on to point out in his article on the subject, the confiscation of bank savings to save the banks, it is no coincidence that this bail-in regime is being formalized first in Canada. The Financial Stability Board is an international body coordinating the work of national and international standard-setting bodies for the financial sector. It sprang from the earlier Financial Stability Forum, itself a creation of the G7 in 1999, and includes bodies like the Bank for International Settlements among its member institutions. The FSB is currently chaired by Mark Carney, the current governor of the Bank of Canada, who is set to take the reins of the Bank of England in July of this year in a highly unusual move. Before beginning work for the Canadian Department of Finance, Carney spent 13 years at Goldman Sachs, where he was involved in the 1998 Russian financial scandal, with Goldman advising the Russian government at the same time as it was betting against the country's ability to repay its debt. As critics like Matt Tybee and others have exhaustively documented, Goldman Sachs has been at the heart of every major market manipulation in the U.S. since the Great Depression, and has been the key cheerleader for the austerity measures that are currently tearing the Eurozone apart and creating the banking crises in Cyprus and other European countries. The path forward on the highway toward the coming economic collapse is, needless to say, perilous. Worse yet, all of the off-ramps that are being constructed to lead depositors and investors to safety during these difficult times are themselves false roads leading to dead ends constructed by the financial oligarchy. But as with every such fork in the path, there is an opportunity for the public to educate itself about what is really happening and discover a genuine alternative route on this economic roadmap. The entire existence of the bail-in paradigm makes plain an uncomfortable truth that the banking establishment has struggled to obscure for generations. That bank deposits are not piles of money sitting in bank vaults to be drawn upon as needed, but unsecured loans being made to banksters who use that money to gamble on exotic financial instruments that themselves are threatening to destroy the world economy. Once that plain fact has been squarely confronted, the public has a decision to make. Whether to continue to put their faith in the big banks that have brought this world to the economic abyss, or whether to use their money to build up genuine, thriving local economies by trading their increasingly meaningless paper dollars for alternative currencies, and using that wealth to fund local businesses and community credit unions. For more on this story and other breaking news and current events, please go to globalresearch.ca. For more research and analysis by James Corbett, please go to corbettreport.com.